Dobrý den. Dobrý den. Dobrý den. Som velmi rád mať príležitosti byť spolu s vami v tento prekrásne mesto Bratislava. Ale budem pokračovať po angelsky. There you go. Uh, very happy to be here. I have to say it's uh, my first um, uh, what's it called? polyglot gathering in Europe. I'm absolutely blown, blown away by the quality of people, the enthusiasm, the number of languages that people speak. Um, I had been at a previous uh, polyglot conference with my friend Benny, who I noticed there, acknowledged. Uh, in Montreal, it was smaller, but it was all, already something that made me quite excited about this kind of event. And, and uh, I think what you've achieved here, it's, it's uh, spectacular. So, uh, uh, without further ado, I'll get into my uh, presentation, if I can work the technology here. So, uh, it's very appropriate, actually, that Benny is here, because the title is Input versus Output. And I'm going to talk about, you know, how many words do we need to know? And I'm going to tell you up front that you won't get a single answer. Because, as with everything in language learning, it depends on what you want to do and what your goals are and what you want to achieve. But I want to review sort of some of the arguments about input activity, output activity, the number of words you need for different situations, and so forth. Again, assuming I can handle the technology. So, the one thing that I always get back to is, and people always, always sort of say, well, what is the best method, the most efficient method? And in a way, it almost doesn't matter, in my opinion, because the overwhelming three factors not good? Okay. The overwhelming factors in language learning, in my opinion, are these three keys. In other words, the attitude of the learner. And that can be whether the learner is interested in the language, likes the language, believes in him or herself, likes the way they're learning, um, has some emotional connection. Like all of these attitudinal factors are so important. When I see the reference, for example, to the Duolingo study that says that 30 hours of Duolingo is equivalent to for however many months at a college, like which language, which learner, were they motivated? There's so many different factors. But attitude is number one, and number two is time. It does, I don't think there's a polyglot that doesn't put a lot of time into learning a language. It takes time. And the more time you put in, typically, the better you're going to be. And then the third factor, which is a little more difficult uh, to explain, is, is essentially developing the ability to notice. And I'm going to get into this is issue of of noticing and how we notice things in a language and how we very often don't notice things until we hear something for the 15th time. And you, obviously you're not going to learn something that you don't even notice. So noticing is extremely important. So on the subject of noticing, I, you know, to me you can go for a walk in the park and you don't notice a flower, a tree, until you've walked that park and maybe gone through different entrances to the park and I'll give you an example. This morning, I missed Lydia's talk, which, and I'm very disappointed. And the reason is, I took a bus from my hotel to the Owl Park shopping center, where there is a dry cleaner. And of course, I was very pleased with myself because I went there and negotiated the uh, you know, washing of my shirts and underwear and stuff in Slovak. I was very happy. So happy that I went and sat down and had a nice cup of coffee. And I was again very proud of myself that I ordered my coffee and chatted up the waitress in Slovak. And then I went to the information and I said, how do I, where do I get the 88 bus to go to the uh, Ekonomiciska Universita? So I got this explanation. I thought I got it right. But you know, <laughs> you know, until you've been there, it's a bit like grammar, you know, until you've had enough exposure to the language, the grammar explanations really don't help you. And so she said something about Ikeba and across the street, and, but there's, you get there and there's all kinds of, across the street, I can cross it here, I can cross it here, I can cross it over there, and I think I crossed it the wrong place. So once I was to the wrong, then I had more opportunity to use my Slovak because I now had to find my way back. And of course, everybody's very helpful. Uh, and I finally found my way to this uh, Ikeba, which and the 88 bus stop is there. And I go by the, this Ikeba on the 88 bus stop all the time, like since I've been here for three days. I never even noticed the place. So I never noticed. Now, on the bus, I will always notice Ikeba. So 
and of course I was on the wrong side, so I had to go to the other side. Anyway, long story short, I, an hour on the buses, and of course, when you're traveling on the buses in, in, on this side of Bratislava, you have no idea where you are, because all the buildings look the same. So you don't know, you know, where you are. So anyway, noticing is extremely important, and until you've noticed something, you aren't going to learn it, all right? And to me, you know, I'm going to get into the subject of memory and memory systems and optimizing the memory curve and all this kind of stuff. I am not a great proponent of that. Uh, if I had, you know, seven hours a day to spend on language learning, I probably would spend an hour or so a day doing those things. But in fact, the time that I have is largely washing the dishes and in my car when I'm listening. So I listen. So what I find is that we learn something, we forget it. We learn it, we forget it, and it's, it's this interleaved learning. And the more we forget, and the more we relearn, and the more we forget and relearn, almost the better we learn. Like, that is actually a good way to learn. And even insofar as putting languages aside and then going back to them, I have found that in every case, when I put a language aside and go back to it, very soon I am stronger than ever in that language that I put aside. Because actually, and there's research, cognitive scientific research that shows that in fact forcing yourself to go back to some place in the brain reinforces those neural connections. So forgetting is a good thing. It's all about seeing things, forgetting them. In fact, I think one of the very useful uh, proverbs or, or statements on language learning or on many situations is you can only learn what you already know. So, you know, if you get an explanation, for example, in Slavic languages that one of something is, you know, adin god, dva, tri, chtiri goda, and then piat let, when you hear that for the first time, you say, you got to be joking. That can't be true, you know. But so you have, in fact, you don't even, there's no credibility for that explanation. They can't have built their language that way. But once you've been exposed to that through a lot of uh, uh, listening and reading, and you've kind of halfway noticed it, and then you get this explanation, oh yeah, and then, you know, the light bulb clicks on and you say, yeah, okay, I understand that. So it's very important that, that the, uh, in my view, a large amount of exposure precedes any amount of grammar, explanation, drilling, and all of that kind of stuff. Now, I should preface all of this by saying that we all have our learning styles, and so I'm going to talk, obviously, about what works for me and offer that as, as one example of how someone learns and other people will have different approaches and different likes and dislikes. And so I feel with grammar, you often hear, you know, oh, we're gonna, first I'm going to just master the basics. I have never been able to master the basics of grammar in any language. You get this, all of a sudden you think you know it, and then it's gone. And, uh, you know, and, and over time, things start to stick. You, this combination of exposure and explanation and examples, and pretty soon you start naturally. You know, I was speaking to someone this morning, and, and he's a Chinese speaker, as I am, and he said, you know, that uh, with tones, uh, it's very difficult to try to remember the tone for each word. And, and it is very inhibiting. And it's the same with Slavic languages, trying to remember, you know, the ending, like, because it's very diabolical the way they build Slavic languages. They use the same ending for different cases around different genders and stuff, just to confuse you. And, uh, but we're onto them, we're onto them. We know what they're trying to do, so we'll get back at them sometime. But uh, so, uh, again, you have to get to where it's natural, where you, where you don't have to... Um, you know, so, so building the basics, I don't think we build the basics. Just a, a, a gradual, sort of amorphous, uh, organic process of assimilating, uh, in fact, letting the brain form some natural connections and, and patterns by, by the brain itself. No, that didn't work too well. All right, uh, so that pre oh, the previous slide had a, it was supposed to connect to the internet, which I guess, guess we can't do, but the tortoise and the hare. Okay, why do I refer to the tortoise and the hare? The hare, obviously, wants to get there quickly, wants to get speaking, wants to get speaking correctly. And so there are various things that we do. And most of our language instruction is based on the tortoise model. In other words, how can, if I'm a teacher, you know, I want to I get my students to say something, and I want them to say something correctly, especially if I teach it to them, they should be able to, you know, spit it back at me. And so one of the things they do is, is uh, you know, there's, if there was this, some method I found on the internet, but I can't connect to show it to you. But the other thing they do is they have role playing. But role playing again, to me, forced, you know, guided conversation, role playing, all of this is forcing me to do something that's unnatural. 
I am not a cashier in a supermarket. I am not uh, at the train station. I don't want to be talking about those kinds of things. Actually, I would rather talk about, oh, who are you? Where are you from? Uh, things that are, are actually meaningful to me. So I am very allergic to any kind of forced conversation, role-playing, things of that nature. But this is very much the sort of... Uh, you know, uh, meat and, 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 and potatoes of getting people to produce something because the, we're in a hurry. And similarly, <laughs> we had the presentation earlier about, uh, you know, artificial intelligence. And I found this on the internet somewhere. Uh, someone discovered that there's this optimum lag time between practice and so forth. But, you know, I'll show you later my statistics from Link. And I accumulate so many words that if I were to try to review them all, following these kinds of uh, um, algorithms, I would have to spend all my learning time doing that. I have about an hour to an hour and a half a day. About 45 minutes to an hour of that is listening in the car while washing dishes, while working out, and another 30 minutes as I read and I save words and so forth. I do some flashcarding, which I'll explain later, but I couldn't spend this amount of time. Like I have 4,000 words of Greek after you know, a month, so how much time can I spend reviewing them? So I'm not a big fan of that, but that's me. And similarly, you know, I got on Duolingo. I couldn't hack Duolingo. All I do is drill you all the time, ask you, you know, give you questions or statements like my dog ate my cat and a whole bunch of, you know, Duolingo type stuff. So I'm not into this. Uh, tests and drills is, is, is not my thing, but it is still part of this, the, the, the hair trying to get you there more quickly. And uh, I, I don't know why I pulled this one up, but it shows you the languages that people learn. I don't know how successful languages are taught in Europe undoubtedly far more effectively than in Canada. In Canada, uh, kids in the, uh, have a look here, kids in the, uh, in the English language school system who learn French don't learn at all. Uh, almost the worst example is New Brunswick, which is the only bilingual province in Canada. You have to remember, French is unilingual English, the rest of Canada is unilingual, excuse me, Quebec is unilingual French, the rest of Canada is unilingual English, except for New Brunswick, which is bilingual officially. And so everyone in the English school system in New Brunswick gets 30 or 40 minutes a day of French from grade 1 to grade 12. And they did a survey of kids leaving grade 12, and they found that the percentage of kids who had an intermediate level of oral proficiency in French after 12 years of 30 minutes a day was 0.6%. You know, if they did nothing, those must be kids who have a francophone parent or something. You know, so essentially, at least in Canada, the, the supposed hair, you know, quick, get them speaking, uh, get them to spit back what I taught at them, approach, in fact, is not very successful. So I come back to Stephen Krashen. I'm a big fan of Stephen Krashen. I think compelling input, and what's compelling for one person may not be compelling for another person. I think that, uh, her, uh, what's her name, J.K. Rowling has done more for English instruction than all of the British Council and everybody else, because a lot of people wanted to read Harry Potter. In fact, a number of people read Harry Potter in translation when they're learning other languages. My son read Harry Potter in Japanese, because he was learning Japanese. And I recently was watching some Korean drama uh, on TV at home, and that's compelling input is very motivating. So to me, compelling input is, is, and the amount of time that you can spend with compelling input is time better spent than time that you would devote to some kind of deliberate learning uh, activity. So if again, I go, if I go to my check corner here at, at Link, just so to give you an idea of, of the content that I would go after. So I, I have, I was able to buy a Czech uh, audiobook and textbook on Czech history. So I import that, I can import the whole book into Link, and I go through and I save words and phrases, and I listen to the audiobook in my car, and I'm learning about Czech history, and to me that's interesting. Uh, I, we have, like, we actually have our uh, feed to various news sites, that, that slots into the learner's uh, content feed, so it's interesting to follow Czech uh, events. I don't happen to be doing a lot with Czech, uh, but until very recently when I'm using it for Slovak, but that's another story. Uh, and so, you know, you have sort of more difficult content. I, I think there's two levels of content. There's the authentic content, interesting, uh, whether it be, 
you know, books, uh, newspapers, things of that nature. And then the, the trouble is that, that typically in that kind of content, the rare words, the less frequent words, actually amount to a high percentage of the total content. It's, people don't realize, you may have a word that shows up three times in the whole book, but actually it's an important word, but it only shows up three times. So, you need to, in my opinion, and I, I read this, this, again, neuro, you know, call it cognitive science book written by a German, Manfred Spitzer, and he made this point, which I think is very significant, is that to learn something, and especially languages, we need a mixture of repetition and novelty. If you just give repetition, the brain starts to turn off. It's not learning anymore, uh, just based on repetition. However, if you can mix in the novelty of something that's of interest to you, then that's going to keep you motivated. But some degree of repetition is necessary, and I have started a project where I have commissioned someone, an English writer, to write eventually 100 stories based on the model, I don't know if you're familiar with A.J. Hoag or uh, uh, Piotr uh, with his realpolish.pl uh, in Poland, where you have stories where essentially in each story, it's a simple story, and, and the only constraint to the writer was use the 100 most common verbs in the language. Like, I don't think it's that meaningful to learn the 100 most common words because that's going to depend on your interest. If you're interested in food, you might want to look at some relatively infrequent words that relate to food. But the verbs, the common verbs, if you can master those common verbs, that's going to help you along. So these stories are, are basically use the most common word, verbs of English, which usually translates into the most common verbs in other languages. So we have volunteers translating into all these languages, including Slovak, which is what I've been using. Uh, we actually have one more. There was a reference to uh, Syri Syrian Arabic. We, we might have a group that's going to do the whole thing for us in Syrian Arabic as well. And the way these look, for example, this is what I've been using, you know, Mishif Sava Gajderano Osheste. Then the next day he says, Stavam Kazerano Osheste. And then, and so it's the same story. And then, Misha Stava Kazerano Osheste. Stava Misha Skoro Rano? Oh no. And so you get the same thing repeated three times. And that is very powerful. I used it, uh, Piotr's stories, when I was learning Polish. It's very powerful. So by combining these simple stories, and I do them on link. So, for example, we have the same story in Spanish. And the whole idea in link, of course, is that you save words, you save phrases. I will, I'm doing a presentation on link tomorrow where I will go into more detail on what it means to save a word, the significance of saving a word, what that does for you, and so forth. And, um, yeah. So, if I look at, for example, a week ago I started into Slovak, but before then I had been doing Greek. So in seven days at Greek, for example, I read 2,300 words. Because Greek for me is like brand new. It's much more difficult for me than Slovak because with Czech and Russian, Slovak is not that big a problem. But uh, here, Greek, I had, but still read 2,300 words. That takes a while. And everything that I have read, I have listened to many times. And so I'm spending all of this time engaging with this, these simple stories. We have them in Greek as well. And so I don't have time to do flashcards. I do some flashcarding after each story, and I'll go into that in more detail tomorrow. We have the sort of random activities after each story, but it's not a dedicated sort of flashcard type situation. Just by way of comparison, I stopped doing Greek and I went to Slovak, and because uh, Link generates these statistics, um, where are we here? So in Slovak, in one week, I have basically added 2,500 known words to my vocabulary. But that's not fair because those, are lar those the known words are typically words that I didn't save. So I knew them. I knew them from Czech. So I didn't need to save them, didn't need to look them up. Those are known words. It's a very small number in Greek. It's a m and typically with Greek, it would be a form of another word that I have already saved. Whereas in Slovak, it'll be a word that I recognize from Czech. And I have created 1,300 links, or I have saved 1,300 words and phrases in Slovak, so these are words that I am learning. And, um, and I have read in a week, and this is not counting the Slovak book that I bought here in a bookstore, I have learned, I have read 22,000 words in seven days of Slovak. And I think that, that reading 
and listening are the two most powerful tools, regardless of whatever uh, comes along in the way of artificial intelligence, intelligence and enhances the, the efficiency of, of, of flashcards and one thing or another. I'm a bit of a caveman. I still think that fundamentally listening and reading are going to be the most powerful uh, learning activities. So. Oh, going the wrong direction. Oh, yeah. So, how many words do we need to know? All right. So, if I look at my statistics at Link, bear in mind that we count every form of a, ver of a word as a different word. So, in Russian, you know, druzye, druziami, those are two different words. And we do that for two reasons. One, because it's easier for the system to count that way. Otherwise, we'd have to figure out that Druzier and Druziami is the same word, which is, we can do it, but it's more complicated. We got started doing it where we simply count each form of the word. But the second thing is, every time we save a word, we capture five or six sample phrases with that word in it. So that to see examples of Druzier used, and then to see examples of Druziami used as two separate words, actually is quite helpful. So to that extent, if I say, you know, in Russian, 92,000 words, I don't dare to say that to a Russian person. He would say, like, you're out of your mind, like there's no Russian that knows 92,000 words. But that's the way the system counts it. And, uh, you know, it's Gavaryu, uh, Gavarish, Gavaryat, it's all different. But it depends what you want to do. And um, typically, my goal is to get to where I can read in the language, where, because my main interest is history. And so, therefore, I find that when I have at least 30 or 40,000 words the way we count, then I can read comfortably, I can listen to news, I can listen to podcast interviews, and if I do all of those things, that my, my overall level in the language will improve to the point where I can actually have interesting conversations with people. And to just, like I, as I did this morning, to go to the shopping center and, and manage to get my laundry washed and have a cup of coffee, to me is not the, the ultimate goal. Uh, the ultimate goal is, the, is to be able to, to read and, and, and I feel once you get going in the reading and listening, the learning process becomes the goal. You know, they talked about the medium is the message, but if you can get to where you are enjoying to listen, the, the activities of listening and reading, then you are actually enjoying the learning process and then you don't care how long it takes you. And to that extent, I'm a tortoise and I enjoy being a tortoise. Oh, well, that's good. We'll stop it there. So. I think that's enough time, and uh, I'd be very happy, I'm very happy to take any questions. Yes? So where is the big difference you notice in the word count between languages inside and languages don't inside? Well, yeah, I mean, we obviously the inflected languages are no, it's not 20 times. Actually, okay, I've, I've seen different, we've tried to get a handle on it. Uh, first of all, the difference between word families and, and tokens or whatever they call it. So there is a professor in New Zealand called Paul Nation who measures this kind of thing, and he says it's 1 to 1.7. So it's not as great a difference as you would think. What about no, no, hold it, so, so, so that's, that's, in, that's families to tokens in English. Then we went into our corpus in our library because I think we have this massive quantity of, of, of content and uh, we sort of said, well, if you needed, in order to be, you know, the equivalent of a B2, uh, if that required, let's say, 15,000 words in English, it would require 25,000 words in a Slavic language or in Korean. Is that accurate or not? I don't know. We would have to get some scientific person to uh, help us uh, work that out. But it's not as big a factor as you would think. It's not as big a factor as you would think. It's not eight to one, for example. No. Yes? Oh, one thing I will say as the microphone is being passed over there, these stories that we're translating are being translated and recorded by volunteers. We will make all of these stories available publicly on some URL. If we get more than 50 stories done in a given language, we will make no, that story a beta language at link. 
If we get up to 100 stories, we will make it a supported language at Link and go after more content. So if anyone is interested in helping us in their native language to translate and record, and we also offer for every five stories translated, two free months at Link, for every five stories recorded, one free month at Link, it's not a lot. However, I think to develop these simple stories in all these languages is kind of a nice thing to do. And they would be available to everyone. Sorry. I have the microphone. Oh, Hello. over here. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Um, something that interested me is that you said when you, um, when you were learning Slovak, that it really only, it came up with like two and a half thousand known words in a week because you already know so much Czech. Right. How have you found, and you've got a lot of experience with this method, you know, so that transferring from Czech into Slovak, and I can, I can see how that works extremely well with every kind of input method. Right. Um, how are you finding, are you finding that you make a lot of errors, or are you, is it simply your mindset that like, look, as long as people can understand me, I'm, I'm cool with errors? in terms of producing Slovak? producing Slovak? Yeah, I mean, I never worry about the errors that I make. As long as I can communicate, if I threw a word of Polish or Ukrainian in there and they seem to understand and I got my best. Because I'm interested in communicating. I would like this lady to wash my clothes. <laughs> I'm not looking for a grammar lesson. So, and I know from experience that the more I read and listen and the more I speak, I will naturally improve. I will naturally make fewer and fewer errors. Mm -hmm. The other question, though, that maybe you should have asked <laughs> is if, if, I, if I'm learning a language, if I'm learning a language that's not like Czech to Slovak, for example, Greek. A Greek, after a week, I got like 1,500, no, less, fewer known words. Like, it's harder, obviously. Those are all new words to me. I'm not going as quickly. But I, I, I can speak in Greek, I mean, I've been at it. But, and, and, and also here, for example, you know, uh, yeah, Romanian, for example, like, very quickly you have a huge vocabulary because 70% of the words are like Italian, 20% are like Slavic languages, so within, you know, very quickly you've got a big vocabulary. Greek, that's not the case. There are words that you recognize, but in fact it's essentially new. So, it depends on the language. Czech to Slovak is, is very easy from that point of view. But that wasn't your question. <laughs> that was a good answer. <laughs> so you don't, feel, you don't feel necessarily inhibited. If, if you've had a lot of input, you don't feel inhibited from speaking. You still practice speaking, right? Absolutely. You ha I feel the languages that I speak the best are the languages that I've spoken the most. Uh -huh. You have to speak, and you have to speak a lot. Uh, the thing is, you know, I like to have the, the speaking meaningful, you know. If I get on, like, with an, at an early stage with my Greek tutor, and we, it's, she asked me about the weather in Vancouver, and uh, then she kind of, you can almost see her body language as well, what can we talk about, you know. Uh, what would you like to talk about? I, said, I can't talk about too much. I can tell you about why I decided to learn Greek. That's, I, I, I'm quite good at saying that. But, so it's very limited. But uh, I realize that as I have more words, if I, as I understand better what the tutor is saying, then, uh, you know, I'll improve. And it, it, well, the way we handle that link is I don't encourage the tutor to correct me while we're speaking, but to send me a list of all my, the words and phrases that gave me difficulty, which I then import and I try to review them. But I'm very realistic <laughs> that, that I will make the same mistake, you know, week after week after week, even after being corrected. It'll take a long time before I develop the natural tendency to use certain things correctly. And it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me with, the, with the, a dry cleaner, and it doesn't bother me with my tutor. Yeah. Um, so, for those that didn't... The f uh, sorry. Uh, for those that didn't follow the conversation I had with Steve before this started, um, basically, if you are learning a new language, you need to be able to read the new script before you can read and learn new words on Link. Yes. And therefore, you would need a basic vocabulary to be able to read and understand something in no. order to read something. No. Oh. <laughs> 
Uh, the first part of your statement is correct. You have to be able, you have to know what the value of those letters or the script is. Mm -hmm. So you can find, you can get, or, you know, open a simple lesson, simple story, Misho Kuhar, and you don't know what it is, you can look up every single word. Mm -hmm. And in fact, because these many stories are translated into a hundred languages, the likelihood is that the translation in your native language will also be there. You can go to a thing, resources, so you can actually see what the full, you know, translation of that, those three little simple stories, what the translation is. But you would be looking up each word. So if you looked up each word for the, say, each sentence, it may not make sense to you even after seeing the words. Very often we still can't make sense of it. So as a beginner, you would refer to the translation. And in fact, in a new version of Link, we'll have a one sentence with the translation sentence underneath it. Okay, so, so no, you start, everybody, you, like I have started, like I've learned eight languages on Link, I didn't go and get my vocabulary somewhere else. The vocabulary accumulates as you are reading the lessons. Okay, so what you're saying, if you were to start Hindi right now, yes, you could do everything from the very beginning from Link. I'd have to go somewhere to learn, like I'm going to do Arabic, mm -hmm. so I actually have bought a couple of books actually, on the Arabic script, and I'm very intimidated. <laughs> but once I know what the value of the script is, then I can start reading simple stories. Okay, maybe I haven't... And there's always audio as well. It's, it's you know, audio and text. Maybe I haven't uh, been to Link uh, recently enough. It's been a while since I've been there. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. And uh, uh, I remember that a uh, good few years ago when I first started learning Spanish and I was reading my first books, I was marking all those words I didn't know. And then I was, first of all, very feeling very uncomfortable that there are so many words I marked and are unknown, then I would try to force myself to memorize them in some way or form, and obviously I was always failing. Like my first uh, uh, El Nino de en Pijamas de Rayas, my first book, the first page had like about 60 words circled in red, and uh, I only made three pages of this book before I dropped it, uh, which was one of the best decisions because I moved to a simpler book. Uh, but it took me a good few years to actually uh, stop feeling guilty about forgetting uh, words. And uh, you mentioned before that um, often the main content of the text actually is not those high frequency first 500 words, but it's actually those words which are in book like two, three times. And then surprisingly, you, maybe you can th throw out of the books those 500 frequent words and just by those non-frequent words you actually can still read the book. Whereas if you do the other way around and only leave the frequent words, you're just going to have articles and to be verbs and so on. Uh, so the, que the question I have is that um, like I never adopted Anki or flashcard because I made a, at some point tough time decision that it will continue making me feeling guilty and think that I'm stupid because every day I face with the fact that I forgot so many words. And the question is, do you believe that forgetting is, 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 a, is a disease which we need to fight, fight with Anki or flashcards? Or do you believe that it's a natural process which actually natural selection, where words are fighting with each other and, uh, and for the superiority? You know, you know, I am always impressed with my ability to forget. <laughs> you know, I uh, traveled to uh, Vietnam and uh, uh, Burma, Myanmar. So, oh, Vietnam, okay, I'm going to learn up some Vietnamese. So I got myself a little Vietnamese uh, textbook. And I listened. I put a fair amount of effort into Vietnamese. And Vietnamese, of course, is written in Latin script. And I was there for six days. And, the, and every day I tried to, you know, remember stuff. And in the end, all I can say in Vietnamese is come on, which is thank you, because it sounds like come on. That's all. <laughs> That's all. That's all I got. Zero. Nothing left. Zero. Uh, my, our hotel is on, I can't even, boy, I, this, the street that my hotel is on, you know, Kremnitskova, whatever it is, I don't know. I kind of look at it every day on my, get, like, you know, I got to know where, what street my hotel is on, just in case. 
And so I thought I had it, and I ordered this cab on the hop along, whatever it's called. And uh, the guy, you know, and, I, and he said, oh, I'm two kilometers away, and could you repeat the street that you're on? Panic. I don't know the street that I'm on. So I think our ability to forget is, is huge, huge. And I think there is no substitute, in my opinion, for massive, besides I find it enjoyable, massive input activity. Because to be dealing with any kind of meaningful, authentic content, yeah, the most common words, you're going to come across them so frequently if you're doing a lot of listening and reading, I wouldn't even worry about it. They'll be there in space in anything that you're reading and listening to. But these other words can be, they can be quite infrequent and yet they can be absolutely crucial to the enjoyment to the enjoyment of what you're reading. If you're reading a newspaper article, you're reading a book or whatever, and here is this stupid word that keeps on showing up every 10th page. You've got to know that word, and only through, well, you can use link or some other method, but you have to be exposed to so much of the language before these start to click, and it takes a while. It takes a while. Now, it's conceivable that this, uh, you know, if you use that algorithm and spend a lot of time on, on Anki, that you could uh, speed up the process, but there's just so many words, in my opinion. So, and, and uh, we forget. The idea that, that, like, maybe there are some people who have a great memory, but I know for myself that if I, you know, previously when I used a, an ordinary dictionary, or now if I use an online dictionary, like, no sooner have I looked up the meaning in the dictionary and closed the dictionary, I have forgotten what was there. Yeah, it's, that's just the way it is, unfortunately. One. Okay, so um, this is a very open question. Yep. Um, I see that you have learned uh, a little bit of Japanese. And your next step is Arabic. These are agglutinative, agglutinative languages. Um, th this is an open question because uh, my question is about polysynthetic languages. How would you approach languages in which there is no distinction between a phrase, sentence, and a word? Can you give me some opinion about that? Okay. Um you know, obviously, somebody makes a decision on what constitutes a unit that can be looked up in a dictionary. So, all we can use, say, at link, because we don't have our own dictionary, we link to dictionaries. People say, I'm, say, I'm a German speaker, I want a dictionary, put this in, okay, we put it in. This is your Turkish-German dictionary. So, that dictionary has some algorithm, some way, like, I don't know anything about Turkish, but uh, it has to decide, this is a word. This is a word for which there is a dictionary definition. So that's it. So that's, now, when we save phrases, of course, the phrases, typically there aren't uh, dictionary definitions, but if you're lucky enough to be in a language where Google Translate does a good job in translating phrases, then, uh, like I find, for example, Russian English, they do, uh, Google Translate is very good on translating phrases. Korean, not so good. So you can actually get a, a translation of the phrase, but insofar as words, the definition of what's a word, and it comes up in Japanese or in Chinese where we use a splitting algorithm which is not ideal. So that it's, you know, 10% of the time it's going to be wrong. It's going to split something that shouldn't have been split. Nothing is perfect in this world, you know. Ah, some things are. All the way. Okay. Hi, Steve. Um, you were complaining about the uh, declensions of the Slavic languages. From all the languages that you know, what is the most deviated uh, grammar constructions where you told yourself, are these people serious in using this? Well, Thanks. I wasn't being serious in saying that. And, and I think it's very important in learning any language that we don't develop any resistance to the language because every language does things differently. And I often quote the example when I started learning Chinese, I had another Canadian diplomat learning with me, and when he found out that in Chinese, you, to say, are you going, they say, you go not go. Ni chi bu chi, you not go not go. And his reaction was, is that ever stupid? Now, <laughs> he's not going to learn, right? He's not going to learn. So, whatever the language does, that's what it does. So, I'm not seriously being critical, that's just the language. It's part of the fun of learning the language. But, insofar as complicated grammar, like other languages have other difficulties, but I have found that the Slavic languages in terms of grammar are the most difficult 
language, gr languages grammatically that I've had to learn. When I measured my own uh, use of English, I found I had a vote of about 1.3 1 between uh, words I had used and head words of dictionaries. Just 1 three. to 1.3? 1, 1 to 1.3. Okay. The next thing is that I found that if I took a new sample of my own, uh, I did two of uh, 37,000 words in English, two samples, half the words in each sample was new. So then you can count how many yeah. times you have to make a new sample to find your limit of where your English dictionary words are. Right. To count my dictionary words, I choose a dictionary. I simply go through a dictionary, let them decide what is a head word, right. and then I count those I know, those I don't know, and those in the middle. Right. <laughs> and uh, then I find that uh, the numbers will uh, tell me very, uh, very clearly where I am. 20,000, then I'm good enough to yeah. read a, a complicated... Uh, Right. Book, 10,000, I can survive. Yeah, I, I think it's quite, it's, you're probably right. And what's more, these numbers are just, it's like a milestone. It's like, I, I often say that the, the known word number at link, or even the number of words that you've read at link, I, I liken it to the dog races. Have you ever seen dog races? They have a mechanical rabbit. So the dog chases after the mechanical rabbit. So these are just things to kind of get the learner to try and increase his known words total, increase his, you know, uh, words read, so it's just a, a motivator. It, one shouldn't place too much importance on these numbers. Okay, one last question. What's up, man? How you doing, dude? Anyways, uh, listen, I've been learning Arabic for quite some time now, and um, let's just say it's, it's so difficult that um, there's so many synonyms, you know, like uh, pertaining to one word. I mean, they have 10 different words for the word table, and then you get anything you can imagine, anything you could think of, and they have about like 20 different words to describe that. And then you go on to the dialects, and then the dialects have also 10 different synonyms, and they're like 23 official ones and about 50 unofficial ones. So um, how are you really going to do that, you know? And, and plus, what's like, a, how can you get to a C2 level in a language like that? And forgetting words uh, in Arabic is quite more simple than it is in any other language because they just don't tell you anything. And then how can a person, for example, reach a C2 le level in, let's say, English, even though he's a foreigner, even though he's not a native speaker? I mean, don't native speakers ha have anything more than C2, right? Okay, there's two questions there. First of all, I know nothing about Arabic, so I can't answer your question, but it is very easy to intimidate people by telling them in Chinese you have to learn 4,000 characters, and each character has 13 strokes. Okay, I give up, you know. Or, uh, so, yeah, but there are people who learn Arabic, so all I can say is that there are undoubtedly unique difficulties with Arabic, but there are people, and it depends on, in, some, people, some people find a certain language A easy, other people find it more difficult, yeah, but I, I'm sure those are obstacles that can be overcome. Might take longer, but they can be overcome. Insofar as this whole C2 thing, I mean, all of these levels, it's a very artificial thing, you know. Some people might read at a C2 level, they speak at a B2 level. There are native speakers, like Donald Trump, who speaks at an A1 level. <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, but seriously, seriously, you know. So yeah, there are, I, I had a banker in Vancouver who used the English language like a pro, like he was phenomenal. But he spoke like that with the Swiss accent. He couldn't get rid of his accent, but he was C2. And, and, and yet uh, he, he might have a sidekick who's a Canadian who doesn't use the language as well. So there's no additional level for natives. Natives might actually slot in below some very well-educated non-native speakers. Thank you. Thank you.